All mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and all knowingness, may they experience happiness and be separated from suffering. I will quickly establish them in the state of the most perfect and precious Buddhahood. Thus, until I achieve enlightenment, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. Until death, I perform virtuous deeds with body, speech, and mind. From now until this time tomorrow, I perform virtuous deeds <coughs> with body, speech, and mind. Page three. All sentient beings, limitless as the sky, take refuge in the glorious kind Lama Vajradhara, the embodiment of the body, speech, mind, qualities, and activities of the Buddhas of the Ten Directions and the Three Times, source of the 84,000 categories of the teaching and Lord of the Sanghas. We take refuge in the kind root Lama and lineage Lamas. We take refuge in the deities of the mandalas of the Yidams. We take refuge in all the exalted Buddhas. We take refuge in the perfect Dharma. We take refuge in the excellent order of the Sanghas. We take refuge in all the noble Dakas, Dakinis, and Dharma guardians, possessors of the Eye of Wisdom. Page four. Until I attain the heart of enlightenment, I take refuge in all the Buddhas. I take refuge in the Dharma and likewise in the assembly of the Bodhisattvas. As the previous Buddhas embraced the enlightened mind and progressed on the Bodhisattva's path, I too, for the benefit of all sentient beings, give birth to Bodhicitta and apply myself to accomplish the stages of the path. Page five. <clears throat> in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha most excellent, I take refuge until enlightenment is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. May all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, have happiness and the causes of happiness. May they be liberated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they never be separated from the happiness which is free from sorrow. May they rest in equanimity, free from attachment and aversion. Page six, refuge of all sentient beings without exception, divine subjugator of terrifying Mars together with their hosts of demons. The one who understands all realities without exception exactly as they are. Transcendent conqueror together with your disciples, please come here to this place. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. The ground is sprinkled with scented water and strewn with flowers. It is adorned with Meru, the supreme mountain, the four continents, and the sun and moon. As a Buddha field, I offer it. May all sentient beings attain the happiness of the Buddha fields. Whatever merit I have gathered through prostrations, offerings, confession, rejoicing, beseeching, and praying, for the sake of the enlightenment of all sentient beings, all this I dedicate. Then on page 11, Namo to the Lama of utterly pure appearance and existence. I offer the fundamental ground of appearance and existence. 
I supplicate you to thoroughly liberate the three realms. Please grant your blessings and overturn the depths of samsara. Sublime master, wish-fulfilling jewel, crown ornament, the inconceivable, inexpressible mind of the victorious ones, the one endowed with the five wisdoms of omniscience, gracious one, the embodiment of love, precious protector of beings, I supplicate you from within the essence of mind. Please grant your blessings from within the innate nature. Please bless me that I may realize the Dharmakaya that is beyond intellect, this primordially unborn, completely pure mind. Transcending conqueror, the one thus gone, foe destroyer of afflictive emotions, completely perfected Buddha endowed with logic and virtue, the one gone to bliss, knower of the world, captain, tamer of beings, the unexcelled teacher of gods and men, I respectfully prostrate, completely touching my head to the stainless feet of the unequaled Shakti King. At the time of your birth, leader of two-legged beings, taking seven steps on this great earth you proclaimed, I am supreme in this world. And to you who will rise, even then, I prostrate. Possessing a body of complete purity, your sublime form is excellent. An ocean of primordial wisdom, you are like a golden mountain the one whose renown is evident throughout the three worlds, protector of supreme attainment, to you I prostrate. To you who are endowed with the supreme marks, whose face is like an immaculate moon, to you the one with a complexion like gold, I prostrate. A flawless one such as you among the three levels of existence is most exquisite, unparalleled omniscient one, to you I prostrate. Supreme among humans, captain of those to be tamed, the one thus gone who severs the all-binding fetters, who with senses pacified is utterly pacified in scope and peace. To that one, the one who dwelled at Shravasti, I prostrate. Refuge endowed with great compassion, totally omniscient one who indicates the way, ground basis for oceans of merit and qualities, prostrate to the one thus gone. The pure cause free from attachments, the virtue that liberates from the lower realms, the altogether supreme ultimate truth to the pacifying Dharma, I prostrate. Having been liberated, they also reveal the path to liberation. Thoroughly respectful of the three higher trainings, they are a field of sublime qualities. To the Sangha, I also prostrate. Then on page 15. <coughs> I prostrate to the youthful Manjushri, to those of the worlds of the ten directions, however many there are, all the lions among humans who appear during the three times, to all of them without exception, I pay homage with respectful body, speech, and mind. The force of my aspiration prayer for excellent conduct brings all the victorious ones directly to mind, bowing down with bodies as numerous as atoms in the realms, I prostrate to all the victorious ones. In a single atom, there are Buddhas as numerous as atoms, each residing in the midst of their sons and daughters. Like that, I imagine the whole Dharma Dhatu completely filled with victorious ones. To those with oceans of inexhaustible praiseworthy qualities, with sounds containing oceans of tones of melodic speech, I express the qualities of all the victorious ones. I praise all the sugatas, with the finest flowers, the finest garlands, music, ointments, supreme parasols, supreme lamps, and the finest incense. I make offerings to the victorious ones, with the finest cloths, supreme scents, and fine powders equal to Mount Meru, all displayed in supreme and magnificent ways. I make offerings to those victorious ones, with vast and unsurpassable offerings, I venerate all the victorious ones. Through the power of faith and excellent conduct, I prostrate and offer to the victorious ones. Whatever negative actions I have performed with body, speech, and also mind, overpowered by desire, aggression, and stupidity, I confess each and every one of them. I rejoice in everyone's merit the victorious ones of the ten directions, 
the bodhisattvas, the Pratyekya Buddhas, those in training, those beyond training, and all beings. I request the protectors, the lamps of the worlds of the ten directions, who passing through the stages of awakening, attain Buddhahood beyond attachment, to turn the unsurpassable Dharma wheel. I supplicate with my palms joined together, those who intend to demonstrate Nirvana, to remain for kalpas as numerous as atoms in the realms, for the welfare and happiness of all beings. I dedicate whatever slight virtue is accumulated through prostrating, offering, confessing, rejoicing, requesting, and supplicating to enlightenment. Please turn the wheel of the Dharma of the two vehicles and their combination according to the dispositions and mental capacities of sentient beings. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Uh, then the true, oh, uh, true chiala, balance, though it's a Okay. Um, so <clears throat> just in regard to Dharma practice in general, um, to address a couple of things just regarding balance. Mm -hmm. Uh Jikendel Tindi Google is 
So sometimes um, we will hold on to the idea that um, in order to uh, really or truly practice the Dharma, um, we shouldn't really be um, so concerned with this life, um, that we shouldn't think too much about this life or about, um, you know, the, the um, you know, having objectives with regard to what our present circumstances may be, um, and to instead have a mind state that is more vast than that, you know, so that really our objectives are directed to um, you know, liberation and full awakening um, without really giving so much importance to the phenomena, the temporary phenomena of this life. Um, and so there can be kind of a feeling like um, when we practice um, that we're somehow not allowed to or that we shouldn't really um, have objectives with regard to the world or world, any worldly objectives that enter. Um, that, that really if we think about um, or if we have some some objective concerning you know the the activities or the phenomena of this life that that somehow is not okay so that kind of um feeling can enter into our dharma practice at times um and and yes of course it is important that we stay clear um, that the objective is in fact liberation and achieving full awakening or eventually arriving at the state of um, complete omniscience. Um, and, but why are those our objectives? Why is that our objective? Because um, there is, you know, it is when um, in the state of liberation and awakening, there is happiness um, for ourselves and for others. Um, and so, um, and so really actually to also, um, you know, that it doesn't have to be necessarily only that, um, you know, that we're somehow, um, our, our Dharma practice cannot include um, the phenomena of this life or sort of um, worldly objectives. Um, because sometimes our objective goes too far so that it is um it is lit you know if we only limit it to that and we don't um also encompass um allow our objective to to, to our objectives to encompass our present situation um then you know we're, what we're doing is also kind of limiting uh so for instance in this current situation where we're facing a pandemic um, you know, rather than just being completely focused on the final goal of liberation and awakening, we have to address um, the, you know, our objective, our intention um, has to uh, encompass also the present circumstance. Um, so there's this really terrible illness um, and we have the aspiration that um, that it will not um, affect us or that we, we will not contract the illness and that others also um, will not, um, you know, contract this illness. And so as we practice the Parnashavari, you know, we do the Parnashavari sadhana or practice three times a week um, and our 
objective, our long-term objective, of course, is always um, liberation and awakening. Um, but also in a temporary sense, there is, you know, the wish or the aspiration for protection uh, from this contagious disease for both self and others. Um, and so, um, so, so sometimes we go too far in um, kind of not addressing the temporary. Okay. Well, that can be the Hindu, Cocas and Jim San Carsena, and what's a similar to Google is. That's it, bet sing to Molia Dinga, Rana Danzita in a man can't you in me now? Don't give you a while. In a Rana Danzi, what a Danzi, you Hindu to me, not so the Danzi Tiki to Yaton, Tirana Yiki, not so Doba Mambo, Ki Yore, what a Doba does on drop on Mendoki, say I did, or some naughty tongue. Lesser <laughs> Yes, Um, so the reason is, you know, if, um, if we really are, you know, like extraordinarily high, um, realized practitioners and, and we have, you know, overcome self clinging, then, then yeah, the phenomena of this life, um, has no importance for us. And so therefore we can keep our objective to be, um, purely ultimate. Um, but the truth of the matter is we are not there. We all have self-grasping and we all have desires and wishes. And so whether or not we're able to um, accomplish our desires and wishes is dependent upon karma. Um, karma and also um, together with that karma, there is, you know, the, the power, the power of aspiration prayers. Um, and so if um, the karma is there um, through making, having intention, setting intention and making aspirations, um, that assists in creating the karmic conditions to achieve what we desire, what we hope to achieve. Um, if we don't have the intention, if we don't set the intention, if we don't um, make aspirations, uh, then we're not creating the karmic conditions um, to achieve those things. Um, and so, you know, to have, have an intention, to set the intention or have the aspiration um, to have longevity, to freedom from illness, to be able to bring, um, you know, to benefit in this life to many beings um, for both ourselves and, and others, you know, these aspirations don't, not just extended to ourselves but also to others. Um, then that the karmic condition of those aspirations and intentions um, really helps to assist in the karmic unfolding, you know, of um, being successful um, in uh, achieving our goals in this life. Um, so whatever, whatever those, uh, those goals and aspirations may be uh, when they are rooted in virtue. Um, and so whatever we whatever we wish for, um, if we have the karma, if we create the karmic causes and um, set the intention and have um, the, the aspiration or the power of aspiration prayers behind it, um, then really we can achieve whatever it is that we desire, whatever it is that we wish in this life. Um, when there is real trust and confidence in this process or in the practice itself, 
um, if we if we really trust in that, then truly we can accomplish um, whatever it is that we intend. Mm. Sometimes it becomes the reverse, where um, really the true aspirations of Dharma become kind of secondary. Um, actually, they become sort of like a side dish, you know, like you have the main course or the main food and then the side, the sort of the side dish over there. Um, and so uh, that's, um, you know, in, in the case of, of sort of you know, having a dharma in our life, but um, <clears throat> primarily being mostly interested in, um, in the kind of limited concerns of this life, you know, not really having our main objective be the true objective of dharma practice. Um, and then, and actually not having so much confidence when it really comes down to it um, in the power of dharma practice, you know, sort of that there's actually under underlying a sense that actually the dharma doesn't really necessarily help so much um so for instance in the case of say illness you know that mainly our confidence lies in like you know modern or medicine um so we we take medicine we go to the doctor um and then and then it's sort of like you know maybe we'll we'll recite some mantras maybe we'll do a little little meditation but there's i'm underlying there's a sense that that's not actually really going to be what helps us that that's not really going to be of so much benefit um and so um so so really actually to avert um inauspicious or harmful 
conditions and circumstances, actually the Dharma is so powerful. Um, and so whatever our, like whatever difficulties, hardships or negative circumstances um, come about through karma. And so the karmic condition of engaging in sincere dharma practice um, becomes like a fount um, or like a the sort a, a really powerful source of repelling or purifying or overcoming those adverse circumstances um, so for instance if we get sick um, and then uh, we really make the Dharma our priority um, and and we're really focused throughout um, that experience in continuing to practice and meditation and mantra recitation. Um, and then it actually, it, it should be that rather than the Dharma becoming like the side dish, um, that actually then the other methods become like the side dish. So then, you know, together with practicing the Dharma, um, then we also, on the side, we also do what is necessary, see doctors and take medicine and do, you know, and so forth. Um, but with kind of the understanding that the primary um, kind of reliance or the pri primary method is, is really dar Dharma practice. Um, and so, so to engage in, you know, Dharma practice with this deep, sense of true reliance and real trust, you know, that this, um, this really works. Um, and so, uh, it particularly, you know, when um, sometimes even as Dharma practitioners, we might find that particularly when difficulty and hardship arises, um, that in that moment, we might kind of discover that we don't have so much confidence in the Dharma. We actually might um, feel like the Dharma actually can't really help us all that much. And then we, we really seek other methods. When it really comes down to it, we, we seek some other method. Um, but, uh, but actually, you know, when, particularly when hardship and difficulty strike, uh, to, to go ev even deeper into our practice, to really, um, you know, settle into meditation, to really uh, make an effort with, uh, with mantra recitation and practice is really so important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、ね、
so kung tate ajang de yang tate suru ba ti kesa to bo ba 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 marang ajang wa ajang sena ama gi ya ankar wa ankar okay ama gi ankar sena tingjo kon so be ba wa da wa ti ankar ko okay ti je me ame pinja ro wa ina chong tong ro ti kimo uh, and okay. so um so really actually to uh have real um faith and confidence in primarily the practice understanding how powerful the practice actually is especially um, when confronted by real hardship and difficulty. Um, so when that is, you know, when the dedication to the practice is kind of first and foremost, you know, throughout um, all circumstances, when that is really our priority, our main objective in this life, um, then um, as we, um, you know, it, it becomes like an upward progression of, you know, improvement. Um, and eventually then also throughout all of that, there is the building momentum of uh, karmic um, conditions which lead to full awakening. Um, and, and particularly, we can also see sometimes, um, especially in Tibet, um, there, for those who are really dedicated in their um, faith and in their practice, um, there, there really are um, quite a few um, examples uh, where people miraculously overcome uh, health conditions, which, you know, are difficult to overcome through even other methods, even, you know, like modern medicine or surgery and so forth. And so actually, um, Dravan Rinpoche showed, he, he actually showed me the other day also, this video of one of his relatives, um, his, the, like his great, um, I guess maybe his great aunt. Um, and she, she was, is a really, um, she's probably in like her late eighties, right? Mm -hmm. um, and she's a really um, dedicated, just a really, really profound practitioner. Um, and she has so much faith and devotion. Um, and she, she, for a while, for quite a number of years now, she had, was unable to see. So she had this problem with her vision that it just wasn't really functioning and she wasn't able to see. And she went and saw a number of different doctors and she was told repeatedly that what she, the only thing she could do to fix this was to have surgery. Um, but she, you know, she was too, uh, felt like uh, too old for that and, and you know, not... <laughs> Actually, the doctors said, you know, that, that even though surgery was the only thing that would be able to fix it, that she wasn't in a situation where she should have the surgery, you know, given her age and her um, condition. So, so she didn't have the surgery, but um, she just, you know, really pretty much practices all day, you know, reciting mantra and meditating, practicing. Um, and she one day had this really really severe headache, you know, a really powerful headache. And then all of a sudden, well, then when the headache passed, um, together with the passing of the headache, she completely recovered her vision. She was suddenly able to see. And so she just miraculously, you know, um, was healed from you know, having this problem with with her vision um and and was really surprised by this but she but you know all of a sudden she could see again uh, and so actually this is the power of the dharma these kind of things these kinds of things happen all the time um in tibet actually they're they're quite normal um that you know um that, you know, when somebody has a really deep practice and they, um, with love and compassion and faith, and um, sometimes, you know, actually the Dharma 
um, can do for us, what um, it can actually even be better, you know, than than modern medicine and doctors. And actually, there are things that the Dharma can cure um, that even, you know, modern medicine and doctors cannot cure. Actually, this is uh, happening recently. So we did, we, uh, I show you the picture or video. So just uh, what happening, you know, just he, uh, so also this my um, brother, he took the video. So, but also he's really sincerely particular. I think I heard her is like probably 10 years ago or something. So also he sort of like a bit, you know, one time, uh, sort of upset, I don't know, but oh, I really strange, you know, so this now is my hair is, you know, become black. You know, he's just completely, you know, gray. Or so white. her hair had turned, was completely white, you know, it had become completely gray. And then all of a sudden it became black again. Right, so she's sort of like, oh, that's really strange, you know. But we are maybe very happy, you know, oh, <laughs> but he not really excited, you know, not happy, but he said, oh, this is, uh, you know, strange. My, now it's my hair, you know, become uh, black. So anyway, so this kind of like, that true chiva extremely changing ちょっと言われてるのとだけど、あ、てにペモボヨレ、ペモボヨレラ、てにちょんよれんかひてにやん、ちょっとソーシャルは気ぶれせやんのおだんち。ま、ま、ボダンでトムソーシャルマスターで
Um, so really, um, also, um, the qualities of, um, true faith and, um, confidence or genuine reliance, um, and pure view really, um, are so, um, important in, um, as being aspects in, uh, our Dharma practice. Um, so, so really, actually, so the, the, the sources of our faith and reliance being the three jewels, um, being our spiritual te teachers, um, having real um, faith or, or confidence in them, you know, to, to for instance, um, in the, the case of, say, this, these examples, um, there's so much um, faith in one in their spiritual teachers and their lamas, um, so that they you know, they're, the lama is really regarded as so truly precious. Um, and so um, it isn't really that um, necessarily there are real kind of sort of like solid um, evidence of kind of miracles and, and things like this, um, that that's not why the Lama is regarded as so pre precious. Um, but the Lama is regarded as so precious because they, they instruct uh, us in what um, to adopt and what to discard. Um, so it is actually through the education um, that we receive from our spiritual teachers. This is what is really most precious, not even necessarily the qualities of the lamas, the lama themselves, um, but actually in what they what they sh give to us and what it is that we receive, you know, um, in edu our education from our spiritual teachers and really becoming clear about um, the proper way to engage in Dharma practice, what to adopt and what to, understanding what to adopt and what to discard. Um, and so, uh, 
ultimately, um, actually, the, the qualities of the object of our faith um, are not even so necessary. And that, that actually has very little to do with it. Um, but really, in the one who has a mind of a faith or pure view, um, then that, that person's mind becomes really pure. That person's mind becomes really clean. Um, and, and that is the, the most beautiful result of, um, or the effect that a mind of, um, of respect and devotion has. It's uh, irregardless of the object that, um, you know, that that, that um, faith and pure view is directed toward. So whoever has um, faith and, and reliance or, or true um, respect and um, loving regard uh, for others, um, whoever has pure view towards others, um, has a really clean mind, that their mind becomes really pure. Um, and so as a result of the purity of that mind, then there is a real realization that can arise. Um, it is based on that purity of mind that true qualities can develop, true qualities can arise. If there is no faith, um, then even in studying, becoming really knowledgeable about, you know, texts, uh, and uh, sort of becoming really learned becomes only something that generates, causes one to generate arrogance and pride. Um, and then, you know, really actually because one's increased knowledge sort of becomes all about oneself, um, then there's no way for actually the qualities to really the qualities of what one is studying, the qualities of what one is learning to actually to actually transform the mind stream because there's too much pride there. It's more about collecting knowledge, collecting, you know, something that, um, that then becomes a part of our self identification. Um, and so it is said that, you know, for somebody who has a lot of pride, um, their mind becomes like a stone, like a stone um, that if you pour water on a stone, it just rolls off. You know, the stone doesn't absorb anything. It can't, it can't absorb any water. Um, and so and also this uh, the stone is round stone. A round stone. So specifically it's round. <laughs> <laughs> or like, look like in the ball. Ball. Like a ball, like a stone ball. Right. Then you can you pull the water, but the water, no. the water is uh, the represent of the knowledge or realization. So not get there, you know, just it just rolls off. Mm -hmm. uh, and so therefore, then if nothing is absorbed, then all of that learning kind of becomes wasted because. Um, there's no, there are no qualities that are generated from it. You know, there's no, um, there's no taking it in in such a way that it's actually able to really um, work on your mind stream or really transform your mind stream. Um, and, it, you know, if we become like a round stone, uh, then we won't give rise to any genuine realization. We won't be able to actually receive the blessings to, to actually feel the blessings penetrating our mind stream. Uh Oh, 
Zoom なわけで So, um, so again, you know, Dravan's um, great aunt, um, who they call Woody, um, she, she has so much faith and she's really an example of somebody who just has an extraordinarily pure heart um, that and, and such um, incredible pure view and devotion. Um, and so whenever she even just thinking about uh, her okay. or hearing about her Lama, um, she she shows an expression of such tremendous faith and you know like tears stream down her face. She has uh, so much devotion, uh, and she, you know she's illiterate. Actually, she never learned to read, so so she couldn't read. Um, but she would often ask, you know, so especially you know for instance when they were young and um, they had taken um, you know become sort of young uh, like uh, monks, um, and she would ask them to. Uh, to read uh, Milarepa's life story and she would just listen so intently she would listen to every word uh, and uh, she some, asked me to, uh, she asked yeah, yeah. To, to read her, uh, Milarepa's life story and she would listen so intently and sometimes he he said you know sometimes he would make mistakes like he wouldn't you know, read it correctly, or he would read something incorrectly, or, you know, he, it wasn't like he would do it perfectly. And she would say, are you sure it says that? Is that really, is that really how it goes? Um, because she had remembered, you know, so clearly, you know, word for word, you know, the enti entirety of, of Milarepa's life story and all of his songs. Um, and so she, she had this incredible retention um, of the Dharma because she was so sincerely, deeply interested that if she was just in listening, she would really hold it in her heart and mind, you know, with this real sense of reverence, not, um, you know, like she's just trying to collect knowledge or something. Um, and so in that way, you know, with the power of, of faith is so evident, you know, with an example of, so, of someone like this. Okay, so now we are going to that is a number two or what? Mm -hmm. 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 So then, uh, verse number 10, when my mothers, who have been affectionate to me since beginningless time, are in distress, what use is my own well-being? Arousing bodhicitta in order to deliver infinite sentient ones is the bodhisattva's practice. That told me to me is that let's say, okay, tongue at that, massy at the tongue at the mumbo at the kitchen of mumbo, go new yore, casino at the tongue, chunk of sim, chunk, chunk, get tongue at the tongue, chunk of sim, bomber chivala, chunk of sim, kinaneta, get on yamechia, yorwa, yamechi, but to chamba, say, a bumia down. え、人事性や、ごみや、あ、人事用具よ。人事でね、え、ティナンセラでね、まとだ。あ、キャンバーボンベカブラ、そう、カシナ。ま、セヤでだね。あ、ち。チンディケナね。でね、ま、セヤで
es Sungdoa. Um, and so um, this verse, um, first of all, uh, brings uh, to mind the kindness of one's mother. Um, and uh, so you have all um, heard many teachings on bodhicitta. Um, you understand that the foundation for practicing bodhicitta is by developing um, the qualities of immeasurable love and compassion, um, meditating on love and compassion. Uh, and usually the most powerful um, object for generating uh, genuine love and compassion uh, is a reflection upon the kindness of one's own mother or, or using, um, you know, the, the um, reflect or reflecting upon one's own mother as a means to generate um, these qualities of love and compassion. Uh, because really on, on this earth, there is no one who is really more special or more precious um, than uh, the mother. Uh, and so, so really in our whole life, um, they're the one who we can really um, feel a sense of deep and pure, really kind of wholesome appreciation for uh, is the mother. Um, and so, you know, there's no one generally who really loves us as much as our mother. Um, and so the, our mother, you know, the kindness to reflect upon the kindness of, of one's mother is, is such an important and powerful practice. Um, but uh, of course, you know, then we don't just leave it um, at the kindness of our mother in this life or having, you know, just, just valuing our, our, the mother of this present birth. Um, but actually all sentient beings at one point in time or another um, have in fact been our mother. So to regard all beings as our mother uh, is so um, important. That's really where we develop real love for beings is by understanding them to be as precious as our own mother. Mm -hmm. My tundas, my amic, ama amic, ama say at Niji Lavina, then such a bonnet is only such a bonnet in it, really chunjum, jigs on it, you tell it a kind of kind and a very chunjum, though it killed over the Niji. So, nay, the Niji to the Tamata, your amic, amare, ame, amare, ame, amare, slavina, then it, the subtle summer zobina, the milling sat on a zobina, then your amat zogmare. その中から、トマヨマレは、トマメワラテネ、チクラナギキチワラ、タメワレ。キンディミジュンセンテレテネ、チンセンキャタタンチラマツ。テワヨレ。エスティンディミジ、サムレマツ。アマチリヨレ、
um, and that we've shared this bond of closeness. Um, and, you know, we, there, these roles have, um, you know, been different countless times. You know, there have been times when, you know, someone has been our own mother. There have been times when we have been their mother. Um, and um, the, you know, this uh, sort of uh, um, relation, the closeness of our relation with all beings um, actually is, is infinite. You know, it, it encompasses all beings infinitely. Oh, that indeed is on the thing that you need. And indeed, I'm not as okay. 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 Being, you know, as so precious and dear, and that they have each been our loving mother at one point in time or another. Oh, that's it. Tira na kita na to mo. Samu yabo yita mo binang wato ti. The superficial way na siya ti na da siya na wati kian siya na wati yori ti na yasa mo yabo yita na ay na dewa do gudo kian na dewa do gudo. อ๋อไงนะทีนี้ตายนะทีนี้โอ้ตรงนี้ดูกันดูเฮียนะตรงนี้ดูกันดูจิ๊กจิ๊กจิ๊กขี้มาหรอวะสิ่งดีจริงด
Um, so, you know, there are some items um, that collect in our home uh, or in our environment that are really not good for anything. You know, there's really no purpose that they serve. They're just taking up space. They don't really do us any favors. They don't really, there's no way that we can use them. Um, and, and so they really just kind of um, become like an unnecessary, you know, part of, you know, just kind of like unnecessary clutter. You know, we can't eat them, we can't use them, we can't wear them. Um, and so, so they're really just kind of a pain. They're not serving any beneficial purpose. Um, and so in the same way, when um, we, you know, or when there's no, when there's only kind of self-centered um, interest operating, when we're not um, really doing anything to benefit others, when the thought um, to uh, help others isn't present, when we're always operating from a place of self-interest, um, this really doesn't serve anyone. It doesn't serve ourselves, and it certainly doesn't serve others. Um, it actually only ha brings harm to both. Um, and so we really want to do what we can um, to, to reverse this habit, you know, of um, putting ourselves first or operating from a place of self-interest. Um, it's really important to do what we can to... Um, to overcome that tendency. Mm -hmm. Mm やぼちやてかれかぼろわ。Um, so for instance, um, somebody who is really just always kind of thinking about themselves um, really becomes like a burden to um, the community um, or or they they really actually um, um, you know they there's no um, there's really like no purpose that they're serving to the collective whole um, and so um, you know if if for instance um, you know, they, they don't, um, there, there's no contribution because um, once, uh, you know, such an individual is only really thinking of oneself. Um, and then even in trying to, to help that person or to benefit, you know, to do something good or to help that person, um, still it, it doesn't really do anything to help or they just continue to, to be the same um, and, and don't really um, contribute back. 
Um, and so this is, you know, really actually somebody who is really arrogant and self-centered. Um, eventually, you know, one day um, people start to kind of get the picture with them. They start to sort of see what that person is all about. Um, and then actually, and they become regarded as being kind of toxic. Actually, the word the word that Rinpoche used is poison, but it's interesting because, of course, we say in English, we, we say toxic. So um, it is it is as um, that person becomes regarded by others as being kind of toxic and people want to keep their distance. Um, and so then, you know, that self, that really hardened self-grasping, that, that arrogance and pride, in the end, ends up being so, um, you know, self-defeating it, it, it doesn't have any beneficial point it doesn't accomplish what the person is trying to accomplish you know through that strong self-grasping um, in fact it accomplishes the opposite uh, and then that person becomes alienated they feel alienated they don't have any friends um, because people don't want to always surround themselves with somebody who is entirely self-centered mm -hmm. this is the opposite this is the opposite เมื่อขอสาธิตเลยตั้งแต่ชั้นจบสิ้นจริงจบตั้งแต่ชั้นจบสิ้นไปกับสิ้นจริงอยู่ในชั้นจบสิ้นไปตรงบ้านเขียว
Chaya yon mari sila imba so sum so sum dewa ta si si ba zong sitila ko ki chiun jain la gure ina yon ta tanda de karsena ki uchimbo ki uchimbo kalam la gure ta ki uchimbo lam la si ya te karsena ta chang jop sum ba chang jop sum bi dom ba ki chang jop sum bi kalam la gure ki hindi ta la tini chang jop sum de la ta na so ki ye wan ro pa si bi na ki ni ki kun jop chang jop sum ba Then it turned on Chancho Sam's new young boy. Yes. Um, the Chibu dream, got it? Tajina Malabna, the Katana to tell you what they did. Take you in this Katana, so some. There was that Sipa's arms here, they could give them a kid. Well, that's a picture of the mother. Um, so, so this verse then is um, addressing um, the conduct of a great being, um, a being who uh, belongs to the ca capacity or has the capacity of um, the, like the Mahayana capacity or the capacity of the great vehicle. Um, and so whereas um, the, the verse before, um, which says the pleasure of the three realms is as fleeting as a dewdrop on the tip of a blade of grass, vanishing in a single moment, striving for the supreme state of never changing liberation is the Bodhisattva's practice. So this is um, sort of pointing to um, the capacity of a middling level or like middling capacity level um and then the the next verse here that we're um, no. that we're now on um is referring to the the highest um or the greater capacity um and so um for one of greatest capacity uh, they enter the path of bodhicitta through the door of taking the bodhisattva vows um, and so when um, it comes to bodhicitta we have the two um, the two types of bodhicitta which are the relative bodhicitta and the absolute or ultimate bodhicitta ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、
um, the mind of vivid wakefulness. So um, sometimes there can be the thought that, um, you know, that, the, that there has to be consistent effort in sustaining the motivation, sustaining the pure motivation of bodhicitta. Um, and uh, if there is undistracted attention, um, that this somehow then uh, ends up uh, you know, uh, that then we, we have to make sure that we then generate once again um, the pure motivation, that, that one feels like something's missing um, if there's not some sort of clear um, intention there that is identifiable. But that's actually not the case. Um, if one is actually abiding in, the, in um, a non-distracted um, state of pure wakeful awareness um, or, or as long as um, one uh, is experiencing the, the naked awareness which is the clarity the union of clarity and emptiness um, everything is complete within that um, that itself is um, ultimate bodhicitta Gunzobla, Tene um, so then uh, within the category of relative bodhicitta, then there are the two classifications or further categories of um, the aspiration bodhicitta or the application bodhicitta. And sometimes there are different terms um, that are used in English to describe these. Uh, but in any case, um, the cause, the, co the commitment, um, which is the cause or the commitment to the to the cause essentially is the aspiration bodhicitta and the commitment to the fruition uh, is the application bodhicitta likewise um the um the resolve or intention to achieve awakening to reach the state of awakening is the aspiration bodhicitta and actually entering the path of practice that leads to that awakening or engaging in the path of practice that leads to that awakening is the application bodhicitta. Uh, so also, um, so then these, these two actually, um, the bodhicitta within all categories of bodhicitta, there are the the aspect of, the, of um, the, the there's sort of the twofold um, meaning of bodhicitta, uh, which is the wisdom. There is the wisdom, um, the objective of which is awakening um, or uh, Buddhahood. And then there's compassion, the objective for which is, um, or of which is sentient beings. And so in that way, they're like the two, um, actually, literally, they say the two, the two corners or the two angles um, of bodhicitta. Which are wisdom and compassion. Uh, so then, uh, in the prayer book, um, the the aspiration bodhicitta, 
um, is contained in um, the line, the first prayer that we read the prayer book, right? in the prayer book on, on page one. Um, where we say all mother sentient beings, especially those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who create obstacles on my path to liberation and all knowingness, may they be, may they experience happiness be, and be separated from suffering. I will quickly establish them in the state of the most perfect and precious Buddhahood. So that is the aspiration Bodhicitta. Uh, 장접샘 세야 되다 아직아 um, and so this prayer actually comes from Lord Jigdinsugan. <coughs> um, and one um, sort of unique um, quality to it is that um, Jigdinsugan understanding or, or sort of um, pointing out um, that when it comes to generating altruistic intent, it's much easier to have love and affection um, toward those whom we already feel a natural sense of love and affection for. So um, to actually wish well-being on those who are near, for those who are near and dear is actually very easy or relatively easy. Um, however, to really um, wish well-being um, for those that we find most challenging, most difficult, you know, those that we may even consider to be enemies um, is really very difficult. And so that is why um, Jigdin Sungan begins the entire event of generating altruistic intent um, with those who are most difficult, with those enemies who hate me, obstructors who harm me, and those who wish to create obstacles on my path. Um, and so, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jikanki だったらね、やだんじゃやめろ。わ。だったら、ないじゃやめろ。天地地差美な。ひんにもとに。たねがこうベッピースは。モスジョイフォー。チャルワ。ペンドラーニョワ。オテンディティニ。モストアブステガル
Um, and so this is really what causes us the greatest suffering. Um, one day, um, in, by practicing, you know, according to this prayer, um, one day there comes a time where um, actually there's no anger um, pre that present. There's no anger that arises. Or toward to the enemy. Toward one's, toward toward these, you know, one's enemy um, or harm doers. Uh, there's no, um, uh, you know, reaction of anger. There's no reaction of, you know, pride, arrogance, or, you know, indignation. Um, and that becomes the most joyful of moments um, because uh, in that moment, one sees um, how pervasive um, this, the benefit is. Um, so of course, you know, we are, um, our objective is to benefit others, but there's the, the greatest, um, you know, when it, the benefit um, it comes to oneself and that, um, you know, even the greatest obstacle um, is overcome, you know, this, these, the, the hatred or, um, you know, negative mind states that um, are in reaction to harm doers and enemies is actually completely no longer present at some point. And so as we are saying, you know, to benefit others, to benefit others, may we be a benefit to others, may others be benefited, may others be benefited. Ultimately, um, it is, yes, others are benefited, but the greatest benefit um, is the benefit that comes ultimately to oneself through this practice. It is through that, um, that one finds profound peace. Uh-huh. <laughs> So in the beginning, when we have, um, you know, kind of a hardened concept of, you know, these, um, whoever it might be who one considers to be a really challenging um, individual or an, an enemy, um, and even when that anger is, is so automatic and, and so strong with those very kind of um, strong concepts, um, then in, in the, at that time, even if somebody tries to, you know, tells you again and again and explains the reasons, you know, that uh, you really shouldn't have hatred toward your enemy. You don't need to have anger or hatred toward your enemy. Um, in hearing that, because um, the, the, the emotion is so strong, uh, even if you hear that, it, it doesn't um, really do much to help you not have that a mind of anger or hatred. Um, but as you engage in the practice of generating love, compassion, and bodhicitta, those concepts begin to soften. Um, and little by little, um, sort of the designations, um, like the hardened designations that we impute upon reality, start to soften or diminish. Um, and before we know it, we no longer even have the concept of that individual as a hated enemy anymore. It, it actually completely transforms and and in fact in fact um in place of anger and hatred there can actually be um great love um bodhicitta even mm -hmm. okay.
So, um, uh, so to really um, reach this state of liberation and um, fully to develop the qualities of fully perfected awakening, um, that which really truly uproots um, suffering um, are the 84,000 categories of the Buddha Dharma. Um, so there are the 84,000 categories which ser serve as uh, the antidote to the 84,000 variations of afflicted mind states. Um, but all of these 84,000 methods uh, can be subsumed into the single root of bodhicitta. Uh, and so if there is training in bodhicitta, then all of the dharma is uh, the, the, all of the vast um, categories of Buddha dharma are contained within that single training of bodhicitta. Um, and so this becomes uh, the single condition uh, to put an end to suffering, to reach um, liberation or freedom, uh, and uh, to um, generate a fully perfected enlightenment or awakening. Um, and so, mm -hmm. the reason for this is because um, the source of all of the 84,000 variations of afflicted mind states is the mind of self-grasping, um, self-clinging. Um, and so who um, can uproot self-clinging? You know, what is the sole antidote to the mind of self-clinging or self-grasping? It is bodhicitta. Um, and so um, Tim, we have all of the methods, you know, so many methods available to us. And one of the strongest um, methods is meditation. Um, if we, but, but meditation itself, um, <laughs> um, it's, meditation itself um, doesn't necessarily do um, the, you know, address the root if it is without um, bodhicitta. Um, so temporarily, to temporarily uh, uh, pacify afflicted mind states, um, meditation is very effective. So um, when we meditate, the mind becomes relaxed, 
um, in at ease, there's a calm and a settling um, that occurs, uh, which can temporarily um, cause, uh, in the moment, can cause the afflicted mind state to dissipate. Um, but uh, if this is not um, done together with training and bodhicitta, um, then it, it really only solves um, like a t the the the, um, the result is only temporary. Um, so so they can it, through meditation we can we can establish um, great temporary peace and happiness. Um, but if it is only that, um, without bodhicitta, then um, it, even though temporarily there may be pacification of um, the afflictions, their seeds may still linger, their seeds um, are still present. So it becomes like, for instance, um, if there isn't any rain, all of the grass may die. So, so there might, it might seem as though there's no longer any grass um, as long as there isn't rain. Um, but actually that absence of grass is only temporary. When the conditions occur, the grass will grow again when the conditions are, are present. Um, so once it starts raining, then, then um, the grass will appear, the grass will actually grow. And so it is uh, with the afflicted um, mind states even though um, they may be temporarily pacified through other methods and through meditation, until they are, um, they are taken out from the very root, you know, through uh, the training in bodhicitta, then, they, then when the conditions come together, they can always resurge, they can always arise once again. Um, but in training and bodhicitta, then they really are taken out uh, from the very root. Okay, so we uh, I'll stop here. And I think we have some questions. It looks like there might be some questions. Yeah, there's a few questions here. If you'd like me to read them, Virginia. Thank you. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Um, so we have a couple, so there's, I'll read the first one that came in was on Facebook, uh, and that's by Lobsung Dorje, and he asks, can uh, one take things from many teachings and incorporate them into other teachings to build upon each other? And then he also says, I was reading the Lamrim, and they say that knowledge is something that no one can take away. Uh, yeah. Um, so first of all, to address the second part of the question, um, absolutely, um, study or, or knowledge that is developed through study is, um, is hugely beneficial. So this is what um, in the three stages of study or hearing, contemplation and meditation, um, it, which are all three of which are necessary on the path, um, the, the, the aspect of study or hearing um, is said to be like a lamp. It's like an illuminating lamp. Um, however, if we only leave it at knowledge, you know, if, if that's all, then, um, th then it isn't, uh, this also isn't sufficient. Um, we also actually have to um, apply what we learn through knowledge and transforming um, our own um, mind, or we have to apply it in, uh, through practice on the path. Uh, and then, um, would you mind reading the first part of it once again? Sure. So the first part of the question was, can one take things from, uh, can one take things from many teachings and incorporate them into other teachings to build upon each other? Okay. Um, so, can I, um, Chick me, 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 chick me
So yes, absolutely, because um, really, actually, there's only you know one root of the Dharma. So it, so actually, the Dharma in its essence is is one thing. It's it, the Dharma is is the same, and so it's all all aspects of the Dharma are compatible with one another. Okay, so the next question comes from Wayne. And he asks, Thich Nhat Hanh refers to all beings as being interdependent and inseparable. And he has a phrase um, for this, which he calls interbeing. And Wayne's question is, how is this interbeing essential to practicing the Dharma? Uh, um, so what it, um, the, the end point of the question was how um, the end point of the question so was how is this interbeing essential to practicing Dharma um, so, yeah, actually, you know, to make this interbeing, um, it's almost like the, the central point of your practice is um, really very profound. Um, in that, you know, just like in the way that um, uh, we explained earlier, which is by regarding all sentient beings as your own mother, you know, having holding the perception of all beings um, to be like your kind, to, to be no different, you know, to be your, your own um, mothers. Uh, and that doesn't just mean uh, human beings. Um, but all um, all creatures, you know, all living beings, all sentient beings, um, when we practice that feeling of um, generating that feeling of closeness and um, affectionate regard, then that's really, um, you know, uh, um, so important to, to the practice. Good. And the next question is from Steve Breslow. And he asks, uh, the right view, as from the Eightfold Path, is often explained purely through a full understanding of human suffering through the Four Noble Truths. Do all aspects of the Dharma fundamentally owe their meaning through passing back and forth through this central understanding? Um, the name, um, ตะเนนลัมเจยรอยังตะเปลัมเจยรอยังตะเปลัมเจเอ่อตะเนนลัมเจยรอยังตะเปลัมเจยรอยังตะเปลัมเจเอ่อตะเนนลัมเจยรอ
words. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, it is as um, you seem to suggest that, that actually no matter what a dharma it is, it all actually always comes back to um, the progression of understanding that occurs through the Four Noble Truths. Um, so, so first of all, well, karma cause and effect. as well as a karma cause and effect or karmic interdependence. Um, so first of all, you, you, one has to have the, the foundation of, um, or w without the understanding of the truth of suffering, without having realized the truth of understanding, then there's not even the basis, you know, there's no foundation or basis, you know, to even engage in, in Dharma practice. So to understand um, the cause of suffering and the source of suffering um, it pr is um, uh, essential um, in order to uh, also then progress to the two um, latter truths. Um, so so it, it, this understanding ends up becoming um, a necessary process in whatever method of um, or whatever approach of Buddha Dharma um, that we we take or whatever method it is that, that we choose. So there's another question here from Janelle and Janelle asks if one has taken the Bodhisattva vows is there a an additional practice that you should be doing that is different from deity sadhanas and mantras. Um, so actually when once you have taken the Bodhicha, uh, Bodhisattva vows, then all Dharma um, practice, whatever method um, is um, becomes essentially the practice of Bodhicitta. Um, so whatever it is, whatever the practice, um, then um, that practice is united with the training in bodhicitta or the, the cultivation and training in bodhicitta. So as you mentioned, you know, as we do um, sadhanas and um, recite mantra, um, also in the sadhanas themselves, there are always also the 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 prayers of aspiration and application of bodhicitta. So um, even just renewing the vow um, becomes a part of one's daily practice. Okay, so if it's okay, I actually have a, a question too. Um, and I was wondering, um, Ripshe, if you have any advice, because uh, you had um, taught a little bit earlier about the qualities of true faith and confidence uh, and pure view. Sure. Uh, and uh, developing, developing for the three, for the three spiritual, spiritual teachings. Teachings. I wonder if you have any, uh, any advice for a beneficial method for developing devotion or and peer view. Mm -hmm. Lama Temba. Tene, Chick Dona Yang, Lama Temba, a conjoz of Temba. What a tende, no jigroa, Chick Luina, the Nepotik on the same coach, a huge church, young one. Um, so he said, it, uh, essentially, mainly, it, it's just like everything else, and that it really becomes a training, you know, or a habituate, like habituate habituating a certain tendency. Um, so for instance, mainly, um, as is said, to, to remember the three jewels and the Lama when times are good, and to remember the three jewels and the Lama when times are bad. Um, so in both cases, to always make it um, kind of a, a habit um, to hold the objects of faith in your heart and mind, um, both in good times and in bad times. And eventually, um, through that uh, training, um, eventually it becomes automatic. Okay, thank you very much. 
So I don't, I don't see any more questions in the, the chat room or on Facebook, but maybe there's someone else that had a question in the, in the room. Okay, if you no question, then... One just came in from Dale. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, it says, you spoke of twofold aspects of bodhicitta. I think wisdom and compassion. Does wisdom correspond to ultimate bodhicitta and compassion correspond to relative bodhicitta? Um, uh, so, so actually, it's, he didn't say this, but um, but I think what is inherent in what he just said is that um, actually they both apply to both, um, because he said in the case of relative bodhicitta, when um, wisdom is um, present in the aspiration that all sentient beings may reach the state of fully perfected awakening. Does that answer it? I have a quick one. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Yes, um, thank you. Um, so Rinpoche, you said when we are abiding in the union of clarity and emptiness, that that itself is ultimate bodhicitta. And so my question is, is that so because in that state you're in a state of non-duality and so then you automatically would not cause harm to any being being in a state of non-duality and would only be inclined to benefit making it ultimate bodhicitta or am i sort of confusing things ที่เรียกว่าชนละบนนี้ที่นี่ตั้งแต่ ที่นั่นทางไปกี่ก็เลยสเปนจังจบเซมโดวินนะนี่ถึงงั้นจะได้จังจบเซมโดวินนะจะต้องจังจบเซมโดวินนะเกี่ยวกับจังจบเซมโ
trying to benefit this or that being, or I'm um, trying to create benefit here, I'm trying to benefit there in that way, um, in a way that is bound by duality. And so therefore it is limited um, just by virtue of being conceptual in nature. Um, when it is um, non-conceptual, it is limitless. Mm -hmm. 뭐 제가 남기듯이 장조 쌤이 장조 선진이 정도다. 장조 쌤이 장조 원래 동단 백이 장조 쌤과 대차디 요래 되네. 제가 남기 그런 쌤 세다리. 어 오다 대차디 요. 되네 되네. 이제 쌤 마인과 뒤모 되네. 딱 원래 컴플리트 브라포트 되네. 이제 고카세 그래. 이제 다 예로는 오지 차디 요래. 음 so also, as they say, um, the self-expression of bodhicitta or the um, embodiment of bodhicitta um, is Buddhahood. Um, and so, so Buddhahood um, is in fact the expression or the manifest expression of ultimate bodhicitta. Um, and so when we uh, practice um, abiding in non-conceptual um, awareness uh, without becoming distract distracted, without distraction, um, then we are um, that much closer to Buddhahood. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so now we... <laughs> uh, going to dedication. So on page 24 of your prayer book. By the virtues collected in the three times by myself and all beings in samsara and nirvana and by the innate root of virtue May I and all beings quickly attain unsurpassed, perfect, complete, precious Buddhahood. May the teachings of the great Jukumpa, Radna Sri, who is omniscient, Lord of the Dharma, master of interdependence, continue and increase through study, practice, contemplation, and meditation until the end of samsara. Hey, thank you.